Our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horab, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and set, see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Persezites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The word of God for people of God. So what does it take to move us? Often in life we find ourselves wondering and asking questions like, what should I do? What should I do with my life? What should I do now that my children are grown? What should I do now that I'm retired? What should I do about the problems that I see in the world? And these are all questions that I'm sure you've asked yourselves from time to time. And I'm sure these are questions that Moses may have asked himself as well. And so as we find Moses today in our uh, scripture lesson, he has been in the desert after running away from Egypt. He ran away because he had killed an Egyptian that was beating an Israelite slave. See, Moses had grown up in the house of Pharaoh as an adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he had been afforded a very comfortable living by ancient standards. Yet he could not stand by and watch as one of his people was being beaten by the Egyptian. So after killing him, he flees to the desert. And on this day, we find himself tending the flocks of his father-in-law, and he sees a burning bush, not consumed by fire. Puzzled, he approaches the bush, and he hears the voice of God and takes action. Well, he takes action after discussing with God how he couldn't possibly do what he's asking of him, and that he's not a great speaker, and God should probably find someone else. But ultimately, he does go to Egypt and demands Pharaoh free his people. But now for you, I want you to think about what would it take for you to follow what God is asking of you. Will it take you hearing his voice in a burning bush that doesn't that isn't consumed by the fire? For me, it took nearly 20 years in a very important Bible study group to help me understand what God was calling me to do and for me to follow what he was calling. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I am not comparing myself to Moses. And I know that I have a long way to go to fulfill this calling that I have. And I know that I'm just at the beginning of this journey. But the question does remain for us all. What will it take? What will it take to do what God is calling you to do? 
I think it's an important question that we need to ask ourselves and add it to those ones that we had looked at earlier. One of the things that most of us, and myself included, are really good at is being a fan of something. As I said before in some of my sermons, I'm a big fan about uh, just about any sport you can find out there. And I can give you a favorite team from just about any sport or any league that you would like. And I'll give you a couple quick examples. In the German Bundesliga, which is the soccer league in Germany, I follow a team called Borussia Dortmund. My favorite rugby team is the New Zealand All Blacks, named because their uniforms are all black. Uh, famous for doing the Maori uh, haka dance war cry before their matches. And my favorite hockey team in Sweden is a team called Jokeret. So I truly love being a fan. One of the things I love about sports is the opportunity to root for my teams and players. And I've always enjoyed the camaraderie of talking about sports with others. And I take a special joy in having a good natured banter with rival teams fans. For example, Madison will tell you that in our house there is no Baltimore Ravens football team. There is only the Baltimore Ratbirds. And recently I've decided that I'm no longer going to acknowledge that the University of Texas exists. I think we can find ourselves just being passive fans of others in this world as well, though. We can look at the work that other people are doing for the Lord and say to ourselves, Oh, I really like what they're doing. We can find ourselves just cheering that person on and telling them how great it is what they're doing. Now, I want you to understand, it is good and it is right to encourage others when we see that they are doing good things. However, we can simply find ourselves standing by and saying, I wish I could do something like that. But the truth is that the Lord wants you to do that as well. He wants you to follow that calling. Could you imagine if the Israelites took this stance with Moses? Wow, look at the things Moses is doing. Look how he's fighting for our freedom. I wish I was able to do something about our plight as well. Well, I guess I'll go back to making bricks without straw. Can't wait to see what Moses does next week. See, all the miracles, the work that God had done for the people through Moses would have been for nothing if the people hadn't got up and followed him out of Egypt. We find ourselves in an interesting spot in, as modern Christians in a wealthy first world country. We, and by we, I mean all the churches in this country have for a long time moved away from active ministry and work in the world to just being supporters of the work. And what I mean by that is this. We've gotten really good at giving money to the groups that are doing the work without getting involved ourselves. And that's not a condemnation of this church. It's a condemnation of all churches. And while funding a ministry is an important thing to do, and no doubt the things that we sponsored have changed lives and helped countless people. And you'll never hear me say that we shouldn't fund those missions. The truth, I believe, is that God wants us to get in the game. He wants us to be actively participating in the work that's going on in this world. And I know that it's difficult for us all to find that right balance in this life. But one of the things I hear out of most people, and I'm certainly guilty of saying this myself, is I would love to, but I just don't have the time. And this is why I think that one of the things we need to be able to do is to take the opportunities that are presented before us. We also need to be willing to seek out those opportunities. So when I was younger, I was on my high school soccer team, and I was good enough to, uh, a good enough player as a freshman to make the varsity team. And I didn't get a lot of playing time on the varsity team that year, but I did make the team. And that year when we played in the district playoffs, we lost a close game to Lock Haven. There were three other freshmen that were in the same boat as I was. They were good enough to make that varsity team, but not good enough to play a lot. But each of them managed to get into that district game, and I did not. And I couldn't understand why I didn't get a chance to play when all the other guys did. You see, I had had a great year on the junior varsity team. I had actually led the team in scoring. And so I was really upset when I didn't get a few minutes in that district game. Afterwards, I went to my coach and I asked him, did I do something wrong? And he looked at me with surprise and said, no, you've done everything I've asked of you this season. 
I asked him, well, why didn't I get in the game then when everyone else did? And he looked at me and said, Eric, I am so sorry. Which, as you know, getting an I'm sorry out of a head coach is not something that happens a lot. But he said, I didn't realize that I didn't play you today. I really thought that I had put you in the game. You see, I had done everything that my coach had asked me, and he just simply forgot. It was a busy game, and he just didn't get me in to play. Well, let me tell you, this never happened to me again. If I wasn't in the game, I would make sure to let the coach know I was ready to go. Not constantly badgering him and saying, hey, put me in, put me in, but simply reminding him during a busy game that I was ready. If I wasn't in the game, I made sure I was sitting right next to the coach so he wouldn't forget I was there. And I would tell him, I'm ready whenever you need me. Just send me in. And I think we find ourselves in that situation too when it comes to the Lord. We might be sitting, waiting for our chance. We might be silently stewing that we're not getting the chance that we feel we deserve. But are we going to ask him for those opportunities? Are we going to ask him to put us into that game? In the movie The War Room, there's an older lady that prays for the Lord to send people to her so that she can witness and help them. And when she's done helping that person, she immediately starts praying for the Lord to send her the next one. And I think it's something we need to take time and emulate. Remembering the promise of Matthew 7, 7, uh, 7 to 8, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So are we taking our shots? Are we jumping up off the bench and going and doing what the, ask, what the Lord asked of us when, we, when he got us called? Wayne Gretzky once said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So are you taking your shots when they come your way? Are you stepping up to that plate when God calls your number? You see, when we have the chance, we need to take it. We need to be willing to do that work, whether it be large or small. And here's something that I think we, we forget sometimes. It doesn't have to be some huge undertaking. We don't necessarily need to be focused on trying to do the impossible, like freeing the Israelites from Egypt. It could be simple, small things as well. It could be something like volunteering to someone that has, needs a helping hand. Or giving a neighborly, uh, uh, a neighbor, uh, sorry, an elderly neighbor, that's what I'm trying to say there, a ride to an appointment. Or helping a young couple with their children. Or just taking the time to reach out to someone and talk with them when you know that they're down or lonely. All these things are the opportunities that we have to do the Lord's work. And they present themselves much more frequently than what we seem to believe they do. Be on the lookout for things that you like this, so that you can be the hands and feet of the Lord. Develop relationships with people so that you can lead them to Jesus. And I will tell you this, I firmly believe in my heart that the Lord rejoices just as strongly when one person comes to him as he does when 100 people come to him. So my challenges for you this week are these. Pray and ask for the chance to be in service in the lives of others. Be ready and look for your chances. And when your chances come, take them. And don't let yourself get left out of the game. Amen.